Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another week of Chasing Frets. And this week, I'm joined by my good buddy, Andy Ellis. Hello. And uh, we're so looking forward to this week because we get to catch up uh, with a guy I normally only see in the halls of NAM, and that's Adam Miller all the way from Australia. We refer in our episodes to him being in the future, and just for people who don't know about time zones, <laughs> when we are interviewing Adam for – when we are speaking with Adam, he is actually ahead of us in time. So he is a time traveler. He is. You know? He is. And uh, a lot of people know him from, as we talked this week, from his acoustic playing, but it w- really wasn't until he came – Came here to Iowa, came to Premier Guitar Headquarters, and uh, played a, a kind of a solo, mini solo set Q and A live stream thing we did, and he played it solo electric, and he had this really beautiful single cut Nick Huber guitar, and that's when it really kind of dawned on me right in front of my face. Obviously, I'd seen people play solo electric guitar before, but about how unique kind of his voice was on his instrument, and so today's topic is going to be talking about his journey as to connecting with his own voice as a guitar player and what kind of things, uh, what kind of advice he might have to other guitar players who are looking to not necessarily play like him, but play like themselves more. Themselves. Yeah. And whether you play bluegrass, blues, or acid rock, the the principles still apply. Yeah. Find your voice. Exactly. And, and, you know the ones, the ones I see that are like the most unique, the Eric Johnsons, the Tommy Emanuels of the world. They just found it. They just recognized it sooner and leaned into it harder. And I think for everybody that that timetable is different. You know. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I I do feel pretty strongly everybody has a ha, has a sound, and it's just a matter of you recognizing that and and going as hard as you can towards that sound. Unleash the hounds. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, so this week, like I said, it's Adam Miller. He has a new album out also you all should check out called Unify, which is an electric trio record uh, that we're going to touch on this week as well. So if you want to hit us up, uh, you can reach out to us at chasingfrets at premierguitar.com. And so let's just jump right in. So here's our first uh, episode with Adam Miller. Adam, man, thank you so much for joining us from the future. You are all the way <laughs> in Australia. And, and what part of Australia are you, are you in now? So I am where I grew up at the moment, uh, which is the city of Newcastle, which is two hours drive north of Sydney on the east coast of Australia. Gotcha. So on the beach, but still very far south drive of Brisbane for those that think it's then close. It's like 10 hours north drive to there, so. Man. Big country, yeah, 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 and and we're so glad that you uh, you just had a new record come out, uh, Unify. I did, that's, yeah. That's that Super you sent you kindly to get that sent out to me, and and I've been checking out, and we've been going back and forth on topics, and the one we're going to hit first this week is is about finding your own voice, and that was one thing when when we kind of decided on that topic, it brought me back to when when you came through Iowa and you stopped by the office. Mm. And we got to hang for a while, and and you started to play, and you had your Nick Huber guitar there, yeah. And uh, and I watched in your sound checking, and and immediately, even just like you playing a single chord, I, I recognized like that sounds like a chord Adam would play. And then I picked up the guitar and I played a different chord, and it just every time that kind of thing happens where I pick up somebody's guitar or they pick up my guitar, and you instantly hear that. It's a little bit of then coming through. And mm. when it, in your development as a guitar player, was there a point where you started to recognize yourself in your own sound, whether that be in recordings or on gigs? I'm always interested in hearing if there was a point where you heard something and you're like, you know what, that sounds like me. Uh, yeah, I think there was, but I think I was also always very conscious of approaching things that way. Um, when I was a teenager, I think I just had so many different random music things going on and you'd just get like whatever guitar or gear you had and make it work. Mm. And I sort of think I was actually truest to myself then when I didn't know. 
if that makes sense. Like I was yeah. just like, I'm just going to play this and I'm just going to use this distortion pedal because that's what I own. And I have a Les Paul, but all my favorite guitar players play a telly. So I'm just going to turn the treble up a bit more or whatever. <laughs> and so that was always a thing. But then when I started performing professionally and into the world, like my first solo performance ever was opening for Tommy Emmanuel. So yeah. I, I, I was kind of just very aware of the fact that I just sounded like a bad version of him. So <laughs> uh, it was everything sort of just developed from there. And a lot of it for me was, uh, I guess, all my early albums were solo acoustic guitar because that's the era, the area I was actually performing in as a solo artist, but I was also playing with hundreds of other artists as a sideman, I guess. So I was playing a lot of electric guitar too. And, but the thing was, whenever I played electric guitar, I was always trying to sound like someone else. And especially like the, you know, the huge towering influences of people like Larry Carlton and Robin Ford. And then, um, definitely John Mayer as well. Like just all those things that when I played an electric guitar, I would try, I'd, I'd have their tone in my head. And then if I was playing a Strat, you know, I'd be trying to sound like John Mayer or Eric Clapton. And if I was playing a 335 dual humbucker thing, I was trying to sound like Robin Ford and it just ended up, it took over everything for me. So, yeah. How'd you get past that? The, so the, the main thing was, and I guess that sort of led to my international notoriety in a way out of Australia was that I, I just started playing acoustic guitar all the time again. So even in band situations, so like if I was doing a trio gig, I just started playing acoustic guitar so that I could actually start to focus back on exactly what I, how I touch the strings, how I attack a note, how I, and yet as Jason mentioned earlier, like actually thinking about the voicings I play and the way I would attack a section of music rather than, and that being part of my sound more so than, um, which overdrive pedal am I going to switch on at this stage of the solo with the, you know, 262 millisecond delay going. So, so solo guitar, solo acoustic guitar, yeah, which is how I was first exposed to your music. Yeah came as a way uh, for you to get back to your own roots is maybe what you're saying. Yeah, to an extent, actually, probably before that album, I did record a trio album with acoustic guitar. So it's acoustic guitar, bass and drums. And I did record a version of that album that was all electric guitar as well, which probably makes more stylistic sense. But it, yeah, you could literally hear who I was trying to emulate on each song. And so... Right. Yeah, it's always sort of been that lifetime progression of going, how do I get out of sounding like me? And the easiest way for me to do it, oh, sorry, how do I get out of sounding like other people and just sounding like me? So, yeah, it was that progression of just taking away everything so that then I could actually put back in what I needed to sort of do. And, you know, I think as guitar players, it does end up a lot of the time with a bit of a gear chase. So I had to get rid of all the gear to do it. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to artists and this topic kind of comes up, I find there are two kind of big camps, not necessarily exclusively these two, but they tend to fall into one of the two. One is that somebody, a guitar player, is, is very good at copying st copying styles or imitating styles, whether that be, mm -hmm. like I said, John Mayer or Robin Ford. And then the other side of that coin is guitar players who don't feel they can do that well, whatsoever, so they like don't go through the the cover band phase. Let's say where you join a band with your buddies and learn a bunch of tunes and and play the four hour bar gigs on Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. Which one of those were, were did you fall into, and what do you kind of see as the pros and cons of, of each of those paths? Well, I was definitely the guy that could do anything and emulate anything when I was younger, and a lot of that comes from that very early Tommy Emmanuel influence. So, you know, I know you guys have already spoken to him on the podcast here. Um, 
you know, the, the Tommy Emanuel that was really my idol was the Telecaster playing Tommy Emanuel with the band. And his albums, the early ones, like I got them as soon as I started learning guitar when I was eight years old. They were the first guitar albums I got. And he just played every style on it. Like, you know, one song was Stevie Ray Vaughan back then. Another song was like sort of Satriani. And so because I listened to so much of that through my formative years, that was my experience of a guitar player is that you just play everything really well. And so I did play through cover bands and all of it. And yeah, to be perfectly honest, I still do. Like I love just being in any environment and still having to change to that. But uh, the older I get and the more set in my ways I get, the worse I am at that, if that makes sense. I'm not as good as yeah. emulating as I used to be. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's a price to pay, but I'd say it's, it's, it's worth it that you say today are not as good emulating, but the price you pay for having your own voice <laughs> yeah, yeah. is you can't have it both ways, I don't think. Now, it, that would be an interesting debate to have amongst guitarists for the rest of our lives. I'm sure there are people that definitely do, like that can just go, here's me, and then here's me not being me. And yeah. I, I can do it to an extent, but I, I guess I just know it's not authentic. Maybe I'm better enough now to know that what I think was emulation then is not really very good now. That might be the thing. And I suppose it, it also makes a difference too who your heroes are because for me, my heroes when I was um, you know, acquiring basic guitar skills were, were guitarists who did not sound like anybody else. They could only play their own way. Yeah. And I'm thinking of Michael Bloomfield, for example, yeah, when sure. I first started playing electric guitar. It's impossible for me to imagine that he could pick up a, a – you know, he played Telecaster, but that he could pick up a telly and do country pedal steel bends. Not mm. even thinkable. Or Roy Buchanan, who came later. You know, mm. it's just, he picks up a guitar and that's Roy. Mm. Peter Green. Leo Kotke. Yeah. Yeah, he did a Bach piece once. He did Beret, but other than that, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. it's Leo. And so I never had that dangled in front of me the way you're describing, which yeah. is very interesting that Tommy was... Um, I was going to say a jack of all trades, but no, no, he was a master of all trades. Basically, yeah. Early on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's the thing. And so I guess, and because Tommy was, uh, he probably still is really, but back in those days, he was a household name. It's like Santana mm. or what, like, or Eric Clapton, like in Australia, Tommy Emanuel was like, oh yeah, that's the guitar guy. So that was mm. sort of the pinnacle of like, well, if you're going to be a guitar guy, that's what you got to be. And you got to do all these things well. Um, but then as you get older and you're trying to craft a career and, you know, and you have a desire to express the things that you are important to you through music, then, you know, finding your own way to say it so that people can hopefully hear that is, um, yeah, it becomes a pretty weighty goal, I think. So when it comes to – when you have students and they kind of broach the subject with you, what kind of advice would you give to a, a developing guitarist when they're trying to figure out their thing? Um, okay. So I guess I'm, I'm going to do the guitar thing first and start with sort of gear sometimes. Like I know for me like a huge thing, especially getting back to electric guitar because so many people know me as an acoustic player. Uh, one of the important things for me was to get a guitar that had no preconceived ideas of what it should sound like in my head. So like I mentioned earlier, when I picked up a Strat, I immediately went into, you know, muting the strings and hitting the strings hard, that sort of Stevie Ray sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Like that was, that was my <laughs> default. And it was the same if I, 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 took on the personification of the guitar in a way. So mm. what I ended up doing, it was about eight or nine years ago, was I built a parts caster thin line and I loosely based it to look like one of Bill Frizzell's guitars. Uh, oh. And so it's like a thin line telly body and it's got a solid rosewood neck. So, it, you know, that already that's sort of like, I don't know what that guitar is. And I'd always wanted to, 
I think I was actually doing a lot of shows at the time playing for other people and I'd, I was using a guitar with P90s and it buzzed so bad. So I wanted something noiseless. And so I found like the Seymour Duncan mini humbucker. So I based the guitar around that and put that in the neck. And it just, it just meant when I played it, it didn't really sound like anything. It just, it just really freed up for, uh, for me to stop thinking about what the sound was coming out and how I should tailor it and what pedal I should use for this part of the solo. It just, um, yeah, made it a lot easier to translate myself. And it was also that it sort of came back to the acoustic side of things where because the guitar had a really great acoustic presence and those Firebird mini humbuckers are quite bright, it had this acoustic feel to it. So it focused more on the way I would attack the strings than the sound coming out. So that that's sort of the first things, like really actually thinking about you know, the equipment you use and maybe just taking it in a little different direction, like just trying something completely different. Uh, another thing is guitar picks and how you hit the string. That was a huge thing for me. I obviously, once again, I'm mainly known as a finger style guitarist and yes, I do play with my fingers a lot, but pick wise for the last, oh man, I'm going to say it's like, 16 years I've gone through I use one pick so not not just one like it's not one holy grail that if I lose it it's going to be a problem but I use uh, I've changed it three times now but the current one is a Dunlop Prime Tone 308 and I use that pick for everything because it's like the closest thing that I can find that sounds like my fingertips almost and so it doesn't matter what the gig is, what the guitar is, what the string gauge is, I kind of keep that thing constant. And that's really helped me um, constantly achieve like the sound that I'm trying to go for and I think translate my voice. And, you know, the example I use, because I know that's sort of the opposite to so many people that have a different pick for every occasion. But I was like, well, if I play with my fingers, my finger pick, my fingers don't change thickness or right. weight or material. Right. So by keeping that constant, I could have some sort of consistency the whole time. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing really is like thinking about, and this is like the complex endless to topic when you're not talking about gear is actually starting to find the things in music that are you, that translate how, you are maybe as a person and how you, um, yeah, just like sort of harmony things. There are things I know I play all the time that even students of mine pick out and go, ha, ah, that's the Adam Miller thing. And I'm like, really? I didn't even realize that. Uh, but the, like, you know, one of the great examples I can think of in hearing someone as their own voice is like John Schofield who, you know, is sort of instantly recognizable no matter what, but he, he communicates on the guitar the same way he talks. Like it could, if you, if you haven't heard John Schofield talk, find an interview with him, but he would like the way he actually presents himself talking is exactly how I feel like he sounds when he improvises on the guitar. Even just like how he'll go, ah, uh, cause it's that classic Schofield thing where he just goes, <laughs> Uh, and, and then I was walking down the street and then I went. <laughs> and it's just that sort of thing really spoke to me, I guess, early on as well. Like 20 years ago, he was one of the first, I guess, jazz guitarists that I really heard. And when I first heard him, I thought he was terrible, to be perfectly honest. Like I was like, this guy can't play. There's no sustain. He keeps falling off his notes wrong. And it was only a few... <laughs> It was only a few years, it you know, it took me a year or so to actually go, no, this is like, you know, one of the most incredible guitar players of all time because he just has this way of communicating. And then years later when I was, uh, I did a masterclass with him in New York and, uh, you know, sometimes 
you would just lose track of when he was talking to when he was playing. It just all became engrossed in one. It was it was incredible. So there, are, you know, wow. that's yeah. that's so funny you say that, and I w- I would love to hear your answer on this too, Andy. Is you know, I Andy and I have interviewed a lot of guitar players. Andy mm. far more than I, but there are like three people. When you say that he plays like he talks, three names immediately in my experience come to mind: Bill Frizzell, yeah, uh, Johnny Winter, and Billy yeah. Gibbons. Like when I've talked to those three people, they talk just like their their cadence in their speech is it just mirrors. Yeah. What what their what their playing sounds like to me, you know. Has, has have you ever had that experience, Andy? Where you've you've talked? No, this is a new concept for me. Uh, that Adam, you just introduced with Schofield, and that Jason amplified. I had never, in all my conversations with guitarists, never made a connection between how they spoke and how they played. Maybe how they see the world. Yeah. You know, because some people are angry and they play angry. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that can be, it, it can be a drag to be around someone who's angry, but it can be pretty cool to, to listen to somebody who plays angry guitar. Yeah. I mean, it can be. Yeah. So, I, so, so I'd been making those kind of connections, you know, uh, worldview and sound sometimes are, are intertwined, but I had never thought about the speech patterns. But I have a question uh, relating to this whole idea of stripping down uh, to find your your genuine voice, you know, to get past the gear you talk about, mm. you know, start w- with a clean palate, you know. Um, how does that translate into your listening habits? Do you still, did you still continue to listen to your favorite players? Or did you also say, you know... I've got to listen to oud players only and sitar only and get completely away from anybody who plays guitar so that I can have a clean palate. I wish I was that enlightened, but I am not. Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be per- – like, as a listener, I love guitar. I love the guitar as an instrument. I love hearing the tonality. So if I, yeah. to be honest, if I'm listening to something – First and foremost, the thing I would listen to is tonality. If I can't agree with the tonality, I can't usually get past it to listen to the music, uh-huh. if that makes sense. Yeah. So I, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. I love hearing the tone of guitars on recordings. And especially if I'm, well, the example was when you'd be driving from a show and you just sort of over things and your head's filled with stuff I would often just turn on pieces of beautiful guitar music like the one I think of all the time that I usually go to is uh Jim uh, it's called October Song by Jim Hall and is a uh it's him and I'm guessing it's just an acoustic arch top I think just probably the the Acquisto avant-garde and it's him and then a string quartet sort of calls and responses and like I just get lost in the whole tonality of that. It's amazing. And it's even, his playing on it is all single notes. So it's just single note lines. It's not really chords or anything. So you're just hearing all the notes ring oh. over each other. But that that's the sort of stuff that super excites me to listen to. So I guess now I take those things, take those influences and just uh, steal from them. But I can steal from them more discreetly now does that make sense <laughs> totally yeah. Yeah. yeah well adam thank you so much for for joining us this week it's going to be adam miller week over here at uh, chasing frets and uh, so we're going to have you back for a couple more episodes this week so stick with us and we'll we'll hear more from adam miller mm-hmm.